right, apologies if there's any technical difficulties on, uh, on my end. I'm just going to roll right into it. All right, so talking about metabolic, uh, excuse me, metabolic considerations for position-specific conditioning. Uh, excuse me, just one moment. All right, good. Okay, again, so metabolic considerations for position-specific conditioning. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking in the in the reference of uh, college football, and uh, specifically using some examples that we've had and used in the past couple of months here in the off season. So, uh, some of the people that I've borrowed from. Again, I'm not reinventing anything. I'm definitely not smart enough to be able to say uh, this is some sort of new revolutionary idea that I'm presenting here to y'all, um, but. The people that are listed here have either given me the opportunity to grow as a coach or have given me some sort of piece of information. Uh, I don't want to butcher anybody's name, so uh, I'm not going to not gonna try. Uh, but again, thanks to everybody who's gotten me here, as well as um, all the information provided that allowed me to create this presentation. Right, so again, borrowing from people. Uh, to quote my good friend uh, TK, uh, professional baseball coach, excuse me, strength conditioning baseball coach, everything is metabolic. So from when we enter the weight room to when we got on the field to practice uh, the recovery, everything's metabolic and should be treated as such. Uh, if you're constantly considering some of the energy systems that your players need to be able to recover from a day-to-day -day basis, uh, you, you should have a, a good grip on what you need to do as a strength coach. So what matters most? So there should be a deliberate division in sport, especially in team sport. Now, position-specific stuff, when you kind of look at a comparison, I got some slides here, or excuse me, some animations here. Uh, no one wants to see two dump trucks go down the drag strip and race each other. And likewise, no one wants to see a race car try to, try to haul something, you know? A dump truck ain't going 150 miles an hour on a drag strip, and Corvette ain't pulling 10,000 pounds. So it's our job as strength coaches to take lemons, make lemonade out of it, so the coaches understand what they're looking for at the end of the day, that's why they get paid the big bucks. We're taking, effectively, a race car and trying not to break it, right? So, all five fingers aren't equal. You know, they're still part of a hand. You need all of them to be able to grip something, but they need to be treated differently. Thumb ain't same as a pinky, ain't same as an index, so on and so forth. So, they need to be definitive means to measure whatever you're actually prescribing within your programming. So when we look at metabolic considerations, you have to be able to say, how does this relate from one exercise to another or one modality to another? And the same goes whenever you periodize out your entire season. Um, from a thousand foot view, one thing needs to be able to relate to the other. Otherwise, you're just kind of spitballing and you have no rhyme or reason to your programming. Um, looking into some of the uh, specifics of uh, football, your relation, excuse me, the athlete's correlation and relation in distance to the ball is going to directly impact um, their time under tension and uh, some of the other some of the other KPI uh, that we look at. So time under tension as well as uh, foot contact times and then total distance covered. Some of the things we'll discuss later on. Um, these are the things that need to be looked at and considered whenever you're looking at uh, division of training and conditioning within your programming. Again. If you look at a football practice, there's seven practices happening at the same time. You know, there's, there's head coaches, there's coordinators, and there's assistants, and there's a whole tree, an army of coaches to match a practice in and of itself. There's no reason why a one-size-fits-all program would make any type of sense. Um, beyond, beyond the different uh, divisions of labor within a football team, there's different energy demands and systems uh, of an individual athlete. So 
the way that I've been taught and what I've been brought up to believe is that there should be some sort of hierarchy in the way that you train and um, take into consideration what's important in your program. So uh, first and foremost, uh, I've been taught um, acute to chronic and also short to long and accumulation of volume. So I look at both what we do in the weight room as well as what we do on the field in terms of conditioning, those practice, and then eventually games um, and the entire model of what we need to uh, take into account for, right? Guys can't come in uh, three days a week and go up 95% on squat. They're, 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 they're simply just going to get run into the ground. Um, so likewise with the actual modalities of your training and then intensities, you need to be able to look at the tapering. So as we go towards the season, uh, training needs to change, not necessarily in complexity and introduction of exercises, but things need to build off of each other and become appropriate to what's actually being demanded of the athlete. <clears throat> Excuse me. Right. So then looking at the actual management, uh, I like to steal uh, what Cody said. He was, uh, we're, we're, we're basically stress managers, right? Bodies, an incredibly, incredibly complex organism is going to learn to adapt to whatever we throw at it. Right. So we're basically like the, uh, like the conductor of a, uh, con excuse me, conductor of a symphony, and we're learning all the different intricacies and bits and pieces of what needs to happen in what order. So whether a kid's going out and uh, like um, Joey said in his other slide, excuse me, other presentation, we may expect at the beginning of the week that an athlete's going to come in and perform at their best because they've had two days off, but we, we might have to consider some of the off-field things that we can't necessarily control. Um, all these things coming together, um, on top of our training and they have to be considered as well. And then from athlete to athlete, you have to be able to consider what's happening um, within that specific group. Because again, at the end of the day, we're trying to produce a product. So uh, a coach may have an assumption, excuse me, a position coach may have an assumption about what a player may be able to do. Um, but we have to, as strength coaches, explain to them why their strengths and weaknesses may play to one thing or another. Now, again, we have to train to try to strengthen some of those things, but we can't strengthen everything, right? Uh, uh, jack of all trades is the master of none. And uh, what's, what's Joey's is, um, excuse me, I've written down here, uh, uh, chasing two rabbits, you, get, you catch no rabbits or something like that. So um, training adaptations made in the field uh, have an effect in the weight room, and the inverse is true as well. So like I said, we have to consider the holistic picture, right? We can't just say going out there and being the most explosive athlete every single day, day in and day out is going to be the best result in the fact. Um, one athlete may, may have some of those uh, explosive properties and tendencies, as well as a higher training age than another athlete, even within the same position group, let alone uh, across the entire field, wide spectrum of football players. I mean, if you look at, um, excuse me, uh, Tyron Smith or uh, Tyree Kill, uh, two of the athletes I have up here, they're both easily considered crazy free explosive athletes. But within their own perspective, um, they have entirely different uh, modalities and how they play and interact on the field. Um, some of the proprioceptive things come into play. Um, but likewise, what they do on the field is entirely different, right? Tyron Hill's not going to go out and hit 23 miles an hour uh, game after game, week after week. Now, uh, the same can be said about him going around and pulling on a, uh, excuse me, pulling on a truck play versus um, Tyreek Hill may go up and have to throw a stock block every now and again or, or chase down a pick uh, and tackle a guy uh, before he scores a touchdown. So what we have to do as strength coaches is then consider some of the validity of what we use in our KPI and system and training um, to then include it and be able to monitor it throughout the training period. So in addition to some of the things that I'm actually talking about, and I, again, I don't want to, I don't want to step too far out of my wheelhouse here talking about uh, the metabolic side of things, but um, some of the reading that I've gone through uh, with, um, excuse me, jo uh, Joel Jamison, um, you discussed some of the, um, some of the congruent improvements and uh, adaptations, uh, CNS and neuro, uh, neuromuscular adaptations that occur alongside with improved uh, metabolic training. 
So you have to be able to, you have to be able to do as a coach, um, differentiate between uh, whether or not an athlete is posturally failing or is fatigued and is failing because of their training and their actual uh, accumulation of volume and load, right? Moving forward. All right. So going back to going back to everyone's CSCS, back to uh, back to the textbook. So everyone understands um, the money system. You know, phosphagen, that fast, immediate energy, things that we use to be explosive athletes, right? The the the, the general assumption of uh, we have that 10 second window, and then all of a sudden it just runs out. Um, it's kind of the kind of the accepted consensus or the um, uh, gosh, I'm forgetting the word, the consensus on um, phosphagen system. Um, and then everything after that turns into glycolative and then hopefully, you know, as, uh, as football players, no one falls into the oxidative. You know, we're not marathon runners. Everyone kind of assumes that um, aerobic capacities, excuse me, uh, yes, uh, aerobic capacities aren't necessarily um, a high focus in football, uh, no matter how you divide uh, your position groups. Um, looking into, um, looking into, uh, Ben Peterson's, uh, discussions and some of the seminars he's given presentations, um, I've grown to see, uh, some of the synergistic components of all the energy systems working in conjunction together. Excuse me. <clears throat> right. So accumulation of volume. So. This is the mother load and the nut of the presentation is that, again, with accumulation of volume um, and increase, increasing of intensity all depends upon how you as a strength coach individually decide what's most important. Now, there's different knobs to turn and different sliders to mess with on what you might decide from week to week and mesocycle to microcycle um, is most important. Um, but looking looking at it from looking at it from a thousand foot view is still the most important so uh again taking some of the thing uh, excuse me taking some of the things that i i gleaned from uh joel jameson um he was discussing some of the some of the repeat energy cycles excuse me um repeat repeat effort energy systems goodness um and some of the thresholds and uh relativity to uh Max aerobic, uh, max aerobic speed. So some of the tests that they use in his, in his studies that he actually observed uh, aren't necessarily applicable, uh, and I'll get into that later and how we actually might be able to test this in football and team sport in general. Um, but some of his findings were that um, 75 to 80, excuse me, 75 to 85 percent of uh, MAS and uh, threshold tends to be the most effective for continual development of the aerobic system. And then conversely, uh, building of that aerobic capacity uh, gives the ability, um, excuse me, gives the athlete the ability to recover quicker for their phosphagen and their ATP system. Um, furthering from that, he just uh, started to discuss interval training uh, in relativity to MAS and um, found that uh, whenever they were, excuse me, yeah, so interval training in relativity to MAS, whenever it is above 90% with appropriate rest times in relativity to whatever their sport demand is, whether it's soccer, but again, in this case, football, uh, what's the, uh, what's the magic number? 46 seconds for every play. Um, the idea is, is that it needs to mirror what the actual demands of the game are going to be. Um, likewise, again, it needs to taper from general to specific. So some of the things that he discusses may be, irrelevant to whatever the sport is. But again, you as a strength coach have to decide what's most pertinent at the moment and where are we at in our phase of training. So initially the base of the, uh, excuse me, the initial base and accumulation of volume is most, most pertinent. Excuse me. And then as we approach a competition and then continual, continual execution of competition, as we see in football, um, they have to be able to, they have to be able to survive basically. Um, at the end of the day, what we're, what we're training them for is practice, right? Um, if they're gonna get killed in practice, they're not gonna be able to perform in the games. Um, 
important. So, again, going back to school, the NSCA's uh, definition of uh, the main energy provider for um, high capacity and power movements is, is um, the phosphorus system. So, again, tr backtracking to uh, what Dr. Peterson has said in the past and some of his uh, explanations of how this interacts synergistically with the other uh, energy systems is that it is definitely the first, um, excuse me, obviously the first uh, first line energy and substrate. Um, and then after, after about three minutes, you start to see exhaustion. Um, but the way that we train it doesn't necessarily have to be entirely focused on it. Um, some of the, uh, some of the um, models from Alvar Meal discussion of how we start branching off in um, relativity to the sport plays exactly into how we train these energy systems. So the repeat spinnerability is kind of, excuse me, uh, the energy convergence of uh, what we see. This is, uh, this is something, again, I, um, I, I, I nicked from uh, Ben Peterson in one of his uh, presentations. Um, all, all of the energy systems and capacities don't necessarily switch on and off. They happen and interact with each other uh, simultaneously during whatever the, whatever the physical activity is, especially as time goes on and the athlete needs to recover and starts building up lactate. Now, um, though, excuse me, though repeated sprint ability is touted as, um, you know, entirely alactic and, um, phosphogen independent in, in nature, uh, some of the studies that he did, uh, with his own players, um, though it was, uh, in relativity to hockey, uh, they still have some of the, um, uh, excuse me, some, some, some similar situations and energy systems and demands in their game as it is on uh, field-based sports. He was taking biopsies of guys' legs in between exercises and uh, basically seeing the, uh, the energy density and in, in, in an available ATP um, from interval to interval. I was able to see that it, um, after 30 seconds of the intervals, uh, the energy system wasn't completely, excuse me, the phosphorus system was not completely depl uh, depleted. Um, in fact, while certain areas of your body may be fatigued and feel fatigued, again, an athlete's low back, mid back, or legs may be smoked in certain parts of an exercise or a play uh, to get more specific, their body shuts things on and off uh, dependent upon what they immediately need. Again, human body, incredibly smart computer, it's going to be able to figure out how to how to interact and uh, manipulate what it needs at the exact moment it needs it. So, rather than rather than focusing in on um, only power dominant movements or only aerobic dominant movements, they need to be uh, thrown together and combined in some sort of way and fashion. The drills that we produce, excuse me, present to our athletes during our training sessions. Now, again, we have to as strength coaches understand that eventually this thing's going to lead towards us letting go of the reins, you know, to, to, to paraphrase or excuse me, to throw a phrase, um, we have to let go of the reins and then uh, relinquish the athlete to their, uh, to their position coach. And they will decide the demands of what they need to be able to do from practice. And again, affecting games. So <clears throat> some ways of varying, uh, work to rest ratios, again, talking about some, some of those sliders and knobs and things that you can play with as a strength coach, you can either use uh, work to rest ratios, or you can use volume. Now, some of the, some of the, some of the numbers that I have thrown up here are from some of our, uh, off season, uh, repeat effort days is again, this is low, this is low CNS work, uh, for whenever they need to do uh, repeat, repeat sprints. And again, it's, it's, it's sub-maximal, but again, the work that they're receiving uh, is still within the purview of what we're, what we're seeking uh, from an energy demand standpoint. So if you don't necessarily need your lineman to run 60 yards, you just chop it down, but then break it in and see how far can my lineman go, excuse me, how, how, how far can my lineman go within this time frame, and then again within this time frame. And you don't need to be stuck and have your nose set on this is how long a play is. So this is the only way 
that we need to be able to train. This is how long we need to be able to train. Um, again, going back to what I said before about some of those research uh, uh, case studies, excuse me, about some of those case studies is that there is a direct uh, effect from uh, repeat spinnerability and then immediate maximal power uh, under, under stress conditions, which we constantly see in field-based sport, especially you think about the example, um, it's a, it's a, a four series drive and they're all the way down to the one. They're gonna have to push, uh, excuse me, the defense has been getting dri driven back and they're gonna have to push the goal line. It's been four series and there's smoke I mean, it's, it's, it's still, it's still uh, a lactic and aerobic power coming together in, in one. They, they, they act synergistically. It's not just necessarily one, then the other. It's all at the same time. So uh, some of the research, some of the other research that I looked into uh, was the Tabata and then uh, some of the, some of the energy substrates and then uh, measurements that they use uh, from VO2 max uh, directly, uh, excuse me, directly correlate to uh, MAS uh, as is uh, discussed before Jameson. So what they were discussing was um, the, uh, the test results that they saw. Um, and again, this is, excuse me, I gleaned this initially from um, Gamble and then, uh, and then moved into the actual study itself to understand it better. But uh, the test results that they received and uh, excuse me, that they recorded uh, proved that when they were moving from about 110 to 150% of uh, total MAS um, that there was improvement on aerobic capacity, uh, their anaerobic threshold, um, their uh, phosphogen system, as well as their, uh, their, their ability to uh, produce lactate buffer. So though, though there, uh, there was a gradual decline in the actual uh, production of power and their ability to recover, um, there was still uh, an increase from the athletes that were trained versus the ones that were not trained. Um, some of the findings from the study was that um, high intensity interval training, excuse me to quote, uh, was that a uh, high intensity interval training is considered uh, to result in per peripheral adaptations that would enhance the muscle's ability to remove and withstand lactate and resynthesize energy. So again, it's, it's resilience as well as uh, conditioning. It's what we see as a whole picture specifically is happening on a molecular level across all energy substrates simultaneously. So um, some of those other systems that happen, uh, happen to get uh, trained simultaneously, uh, one being the en uh, endocrine system. So when we're managing all these things simultaneously um, from, the, from the CNS as well as um, the, actual, the actual hormonal response, we have to be able to see uh, what's happening to our athletes specifically and individually. You know, if a guy comes in and he may be cramping, uh, again, we can't, we can't expect him to be able to come in and uh, produce a maximal effort um, from day to day. So we have to be able to use our coach's eye to be a little smarter than just being the straight up robots. You know, there's a, there's, there's a happy medium between understanding the numbers and then producing uh, proper results and kind of being more of a traditional uh, hands-on coach and understanding, you know, getting your hands dirty. So um, stealing from stealing from two two really good uh, coaches. So initially um, on the left, I want to discuss um, Charlie Francis high-low modeling and how we might be able to actually uh, excuse me. Yeah, so the high-low modeling, how we might be able to actually uh, predict and then look at this from like a weekly basis. So. Uh, given the 48 hour rule of, um, of a high CNS day, uh, it's likely also going to be uh, extremely uh, peripherally fatiguing, um, excuse me, not peripherally fatiguing, uh, um, but fatiguing on our um, uh, phosphogen system. God. Um, so we have, to, we have to be able to account and then uh, relax, uh, excuse me, not relax, but um, kind of reel the training in and not necessarily uh, drive your guys into the ground. Otherwise, you're going to end up pulling a hamstring or some other sort of, excuse me, some sort of other soft tissue injury is likely to occur. Um, and that's not necessarily to say that uh, you have to do nothing and then take it easy on the days in between. Again, as I was discussing before with repeat sprint ability, it can be submaximal effort and still train uh, those aerobic systems. And then you still gain um, uh, maximal uh, elective capacity 
or excuse me, yes, ma uh, maximal alactic capacity um, from training those systems. Uh, it's a uh, thing about like uh, increasing the stroke on a piston versus, or excuse me, increasing the bore on a piston versus increasing the stroke. Um, and then, uh, and then again, looking uh, looking towards Alvar Meal's Alvar Meal's uh, explanation of how we need to be able to incorporate this um, as we progress training is that instead of uh, like event specific athletes uh, are are or excuse me event specific athletes where they eventually taper their training to be more and more specific as they get closer to their event um, we need to be as general as possible and non specific in our uh, uh, skill excuse me skill acquisition and adaptation and then broaden the horizon in the amount of movements and movement patterns that our athletes are able to comprehensively understand and then reproduce um, football is kind of a chaotic and hectic game. Uh, there's 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 always a lot going on, and it's it's never a dull moment. So what does it look like? What does it look like? So on some of these high CNS days, again, where we're trying to get some of the maximal effort out of our athletes, it's pretty easy to see. You know, anyone who's been out and actually coached a sprint day in a session understands. Um, what an athlete's going to look like whenever they're sprinting as hard as they possibly can. They're, they're kind of, they're kind of uh, kyphotically bound up, maybe pumping their fists as hard as they can, and their face and their tendons are going. But um, though we may, you know, try to coach against some of those things and try to get them to be a little bit more efficient in the systems, um, it's still pretty easy to see. You don't necessarily have to pull the guy off, you know, into a biopsy or, or, or hook him up to some sort of EKG machine, excuse me, EKG, heart rate monitor, um, every single rep, you know, uh, going back to what, uh, coach Garacio said in, um, in, in, uh, his discussion about the coach's eye, um, you can, you can see sort of some of the leaks, you know, the, some, some of the ooze, excuse me, that was the phrase he uttered. Uh, some of the ooze whenever you're, whenever you're ob observing an athlete, whenever they fall out of posture it is immediately and very easy to tell that even a novice coach is able to understand. So I got some of the examples here. Uh, you'll have to forgive me again. Like Coach, uh, Coach Ray said, we're kind of we're kind of shorthanded here, and the fact that we're not uh, we're not immediately uh, given access to some of the some of the tools that we've had in the past. Um, so some of the examples in the division of how uh, we might uh, we might prescribe some exercises uh, on the field in an actual uh, outside environment during a session uh, with some of our heavier guys. My example here on the left. Uh, would be a med ball throw or a med ball bound. Um, so uh, in the pictures diagram that he's got kind of an overhand position, but we, we uh, typically want to have them in an underhand position, again, bound out as, uh, as hard and as far as they possibly can, and then immediately have to load up and then produce force and then throw it up as hard and as far as they possibly can. Now, the repeated effort of this and progression of this is where we eventually develop their energy systems but the specificity in how we make linemen do this rather than mids or, or skills. And again, wherever those lines fall kind of depend upon what the sport coach, or excuse me, the position coach uh, determines initially um, is gonna affect how their training overall ends up um, whenever the season comes around. And then again, I, got have one, um, I have another example here for what we might do for uh, some of the skill players. Try to play that through a couple of times so you can see. So again, it's max effort exercise and it can be repeated and kind of scaled up or scaled down however many times or ways that we need to be able to uh, express stress to our athletes and get whatever we need out of them from that day. Yep. Again, oh. Again, um, where where you might have the division lines between big, mid, and skill kind of depends upon um, some 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 preset decisions. So again, if you'll direct your attention to the trap bar here, um, one of the exercises you might have for more um, for more push based athlete, uh, someone who's a little bit closer to the ball, uh, is a trap bar jump. Again, developing some of those energy systems, um, excuse me, the, um, 
the phosphorus and energy system, uh, we're able to scale this up and scale this down so we can get a, uh, an aerobic effect um, or entirely anaerobic effect. Again, it's dependent upon how you attenuate, attenuate volume and then pace of the lift itself, as opposed to something that's a little bit, a uh, little bit more uh, geared towards sprinting we have for our skill athletes on the right. And I'll play that through a couple times. Again, some of the sports specificity has to start tapering towards the game itself. Now, these are some of the more general, general examples of what we might use in the off season. But again, you have to understand that not everything, not, not everything's going to look perfect, right? And you, you have to allow for the athlete to kind of understand and eventually develop some of that CNS, uh, excuse me, the peripheral CNS uh, development will eventually understand the exercise and then you'll be able to get a little bit better sense of where the athlete's energy systems might be. Right. So we have to have efficient measurements. <clears throat> so again, we can't necessarily use MAS or v, uh, VO2 max or biopsies in the middle of a practice or a session whenever we're out in the field. So um, Leaning towards leaning towards some of the more practical methods again the coach's eye, and then uh, playing with what we understand the the exercise to look like, you can then start kind of messing with distances and times and intervals, and then again some of the modalities of training themselves. So a chase environment or excuse me a chase based drill in that environment, um, the athletes uh, naturally going to excuse me the competitive athletes naturally going to be able to produce more uh, from a neurological standpoint. And again, that's some of that CNS development that we can kind of manipulate and then use for some of their energy development, right? Eight, 85 to 100 players all with masks on or, or, or getting needles in their legs, just, it ain't going to happen. So we as coaches have to uh, copy or, excuse me, observe and copy what does work and then reject what doesn't. So some of the more practical examples of what we may, uh, may be able to use and then actually... Um, use some of the data provided um, by these GPS systems um, are, are, are things like polar and uh, open field, or excuse me, catapult um, and open field. Um, so there's, 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 there's pluses and minuses. Um, some of the benefits, uh, we see that we can have individualized uh, profiles so we can get really specific with some of our athletes and then kind of scale it up or down, uh, scale, excuse me, scale it up or down uh, depending upon uh, what's most important or what we, what we, what we might see um, as coaches needs to be observed more. Um, and then again, we can kind of track uh, some of the implementation of our, uh, of our exercises and see what does work and what doesn't work. So then we can, we can kind of track on a timeline uh, the same way that we might track uh, an in-game or, or a live session. We can see what's happening immediately. We can compare apples to apples and say, uh, this exercise works and this exercise doesn't. Um, some of them actually have heart rate monitors built into them. Um, so HRV alongside with um, VO2 max, excuse me, yeah, uh, VO2 max is actually a really good indication of uh, what we're getting out of the athletes and what they're getting out of the exercise itself. Um, some, of the, some of the drawbacks, though, um, are in some cases reliability, although they're getting better, in my opinion. And then um, the cost-benefit analysis. You know, not, not every university necessarily has $100,000 to just dump in a GPS tracking or heart rate monitors. So um, again, you can kind of use some of those more rudimentary skills and um, uh, adaptations we have as strength coaches to attenuate volume and then track and observe what your athletes are doing. So, so just some of the characteristics of the phases uh, that we might go through, so the off season, um, there's greatly more volume done in the weight room. Uh, we're almost the like primary coach that, they, that they're gonna see uh, as athletes, you know, the strength coaches like, the first line or whatever. Um, and then the training taper uh, should introduce uh, volume, excuse me, more and more volume, again, relative to whatever practices are going to be. So going back to, um, going back to uh, some of the specificity, um, uh, working under uh, Coach Kier when I'm flat, uh, divided into three, and that's uh, generally what I'm able to observe across a wide variety of coaches uh, in America. Um, uh, compared with coaches like Tim Karen, or he just uh, divides it to inside and outside the box uh, at Army when they had the uh, triple option. It's just dependent upon play styles. You have, to, you have to understand what the demands are going to be when they're coming 
and then what what it should look like when the time comes. Um, and then again, um, the, the the last little bit of the energy system development uh, are, are, are some of the dietary needs and developments, what they need to be honed in on at that moment. You're going to have the most time with them during the off-season, so you might as well educate your athletes what they need to be eating, what they need to be drinking, what they don't need to be drinking, what they don't need to be eating, some of the other sleep habits and stuff like that. Going into the preseason, you know, training camp, some other uh, voluminous times whenever they're on the field. Um, excuse me. Uh, the training knowledge should carry over from, from off season to preseason, right? They're not going to just automatically forget how to do a power clean. They're going to not forget how to do a trap bar jump. Um, that being said, there still will be some drop off and you should not necessarily introduce new, uh, new training modalities to the program. Now, some of the efficiencies and proficiencies of the athlete um, during the sessions need to improve and need to visually improve. Otherwise, they need to be um, regressed and drawn back because something else isn't clicking. It's not necessarily just them getting smoked during a workout and not being able to breathe. Um, then again, you're going to transition into them going into more practices, right? Uh, lifts tend to be more uh, maintenance-based and uh, same thing goes for running or conditioning. Anything on foot uh, is going to be compared to what's already been done uh, for us as strength coaches. Um, and then I've seen um, from uh, uh, observing some uh, GPS numbers, uh, generally speaking, dependent upon um, what kind of play style there is for some skill players, there's going to be about 5,000 to 6,500 yards of a uh, total ground contact, or excuse me. Yeah. Uh, total ground contact times. Um, and again, um, some of the beliefs that have been instilled within me is that intensity uh, should uh, should fluctuate in volume, not necessarily percentages. Uh, you, you still need to be able to train heavy. Um, likewise, you still need to be able to produce a significant amount of power, jump high, jump far, or throw far, uh, whatever the case may be. And, you know, um, at the end of the day, it's go time. When they're, uh, whenever the season comes, they need to be ready. You know, it's 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 if if you're training. Uh, if you're training for conditioning, by the time the season shows up, it's already too late. It's the same thing like if you're if you're trying to drink water right before training session, you're already dehydrated. Like you're 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 a day late and a dollar short. It's it's too far too far gone at that point. Um, and then again, this cannot be stressed enough is that there really needs to be re uh, regenerative focus regenerative focus um, around your training sessions and how you periodize and plan them out. So just um, just a, a quick point is um, some of the detraining uh, that you, you're going to be able to observe during some off seasons and in between periods. Uh, the transitional stages like spring break and then winter break and things like that. Um, I found some information um, from DuPont uh, talking about uh, him observing detraining of uh, MAS levels from athletes after a four week break, um, dependent upon the training age and the level of athlete that you that you have. Uh, could be anywhere from five to fifteen percent, um, and then again with the frequency and training and how uh, prepared they initially were. Um, so then, some of the training modalities are going to be uh, the most paramount in what you and what you choose to use in the in, in the later weeks of the season. Um, once you get, uh, excuse me, once you start getting towards um, a national title run, uh, you, you 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 can't be throwing you can't be throwing ninety five hundred percent on their back or you know, on the bar every time you go into the weight room and you only may get a certain amount of training sessions depending upon what bowl season is looking like. So just wrapping up, um, I'd like to open the forum up if there's any questions uh, or uh, comments or concerns. Again, I'd like to thank everybody who um, allowed me to get to this point uh, as well as everybody who uh, produced just fantastic information and research uh, that allowed me to delve into this topic. Um, so then I'd like to open the floor to, uh, to uh, questions. Try to read over here. Uh, looks like we don't have anything on YouTube. Uh, turn to the panel. You guys have anything? 